Here's an idea. The hoodie is dead. Long live the hoodie. American Apparel is closing. In lots of places, it's closed. Don't bother trekking however far, hoping to avail yourself of the t-shirts, hot pants, jumpers, or underwear. The basics, once slung with such gusto, they are no more. On the occasion of such a loss, some may be lamenting, some may be celebrating, and I thought we might pause and use this moment as an excuse to explore the history of the most stalwart of American Apparel's basics. That which American Apparel itself called an icon, besides the t-shirt, the item upon which it first staked its business. It's the piece of wear that I most closely associate with the shop. Most people most closely associate with butts, but not me. When I think American Apparel, I think the hoodie. To be fair, American Apparel does not have a sole claim to the hoodie, only a single place in its history. One that we'll eventually get to on a path following the hoodie's function in the past, present, and future of American culture. A long, struggle-filled story brought this item from relative obscurity to worldwide prominence. And that story begins in Europe, around the 12th century. That is, if you want to draw a connection between hooded monk robes, tunics, and capes, and this, the hooded sweatshirt. It would take some hundreds of years for the transformation to play out, and it was dependent in part upon the invention of the sweater. In the mid-16th century, sweater meant someone who does manual labor, or that person's boss. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that sweater referred to an article of clothing that made someone perspire so they'd lose weight, and not until the late 19th century did it mean simply warm, woolen, cozy clothing. Champion, the American clothing brand, is credited with creating the first hooded sweatshirt, which I'm gonna go on record saying I think is different from the hoodie, but we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Champion made their hooded sweatshirt for warehouse workers toiling in the frozen tundra of upstate New York, where Champion was headquartered. Sweaters, working for sweaters, hoping that they would get warm enough to sweat. And this is important. The hooded sweatshirt has, since its beginning, always been associated with labor. So perhaps it makes sense that over a few decades, the hooded sweatshirt and sweatpants became associated with another kind of work, athletics. Alongside track and field athletes, the sweatsuit became common garb for boxers, hoping to sweat off pounds and land in a lower weight class. That use led to what is touted as the hooded sweatshirt's first starring role. Writing for the New York Times in 2006, Dennis Wilson credits Rocky with being the first famous hooded sweatshirt wearer. In the film's two most iconic scenes, Rocky dons a gray hooded sweatshirt. We see him in a meat locker pummeling beef and as he ascends the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Triumphantly, he raises his arms and looks out over the city. Rocky has labored, he has perspired, and now he's ready for his championship match. Wilson and others then draw a connection between the attitude Rocky brought to the garment and that sought by members of the then burgeoning hip hop movement in New York City working class underdogs, an us against the world profile, as Wilson puts it. The city dwelling hoodie wearer is, as sociologist Mark Featherstone says in his 2013 paper, Hoodie Horror, the capitalist other, a reminder to the successful what they might be without their wealth. Of course, once something makes its way into hip hop culture, it's only a matter of time before it's subsumed by popular culture. Troy Patterson, in his 2016 article, Hoodie Politics, singles out LL Cool J's 1990 music video for Mama Said Knock You Out as the herald of just such a transition. It's a youthful boxing-themed commercial hip-hop hit, which prominently features a hooded sweatshirt. Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, and other fashion houses began making fashionable hooded sweatshirts in the early 90s, and during this period, the garment gets its now iconic name simply the hoodie. The item became a skate and snowboarding staple by the late 90s, the black hoodie specifically a punk and metal accoutrement not long after, and a hipster basic by the early to mid 2000s, which is likely both cause and effect of its American apparel association. Now, famous hoodie wearers are a very diverse bunch. Kanye West, Jessica Jones, Mark Zuckerberg, the Unabomber, Spider-Gwen, Patriots coach Bill Belichick, and most significantly, Trayvon Martin. In 2012, Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman in Sanford, Florida. Zimmerman described Martin, who was 17 years old, wearing a hoodie and walking home from a convenience store after purchasing some snacks as a real suspicious guy to the police, whom he called to report Martin's presence at the gated community where they both lived. 
Zimmerman fatally shot Martin less than 100 yards from his home. He was charged with murder, but acquitted on grounds of self-defense. The lack of evidence for any wrongdoing by Trayvon Martin, save Zimmerman's judgment based largely on Martin's appearance, led to accusations that the case was mishandled at every level and made Martin's death a national symbol for race relations and gun violence in the United States. One of the many demonstrations held in Trayvon's memory is known as the Million Hoodie March. It may be worth noting the complex web of meaning that exists between hoodie, used to reference an item of clothing, and in the UK, the very person wearing it, hood, as a shorthand for hoodlum or gangster, used in both modern and mid-century American slang for gang members and the mafia, as well as hood short for neighborhood, a term often used to imply a place that's crime-ridden with low-income residents. I'm not saying that these things are all purposefully related, that someone sat down to sketch out this network of hood-related meaning. But neither do I think such a coincidence can be totally divorced from what this item of clothing was and is. A traditionally utilitarian piece with a genesis in working class labor, even struggle, and capitalist otherness that's also worn by billionaire tech moguls. So I may propose a distinction between the hoodie and the hooded sweatshirt. Trayvon did not wear a hooded sweatshirt, but a hoodie. The kids around estate housing and in East London don't wear hooded sweatshirts, but wear and are hoodies. They become the thing that symbolizes their otherness. Mark Zuckerberg wears a hooded sweatshirt. While Zuck, startup culture, and even Silicon Valley may stake a particular claim in the hoodie as uniform of labor, such a fact is often treated as a quirk. No one will mistake Zuck or his employees for the clothing that they happen to wear. And I don't care what the merch page says, Bill Belichick does not wear a hoodie. He wears a hooded sweatshirt. The object becomes itself based upon who is wearing it, but if the right person wears it, they can become something as well. And as the story of Trayvon Martin makes clear, all of this hemming over the distinctions of thick cloth wrapped around bodies isn't just frivolous, overthought taxonomizing. The way in which hoodiness is appreciated as separate from hooded sweatshirtness is on people's minds, as it should be. It has real effects. Mike Coulter, who plays Luke Cage, talked about his character's hoodie donned instead of a super suit. It was no accident, Coulter says, that a black superhero fighting crime would don such a symbolic item. He talks about his one-time personal aversion to hoodies due to their associations, but also explains that both personally and professionally, he became interested in almost reclaiming the hoodie, showing how when a black man wears one, he is not necessarily a threat and could in fact be a hero. All people who wear hoodies are not criminals. All people who wear hoodies are not threats. So we wanted to, you know, we wanted to shake it up a little bit. So it's a symbolic thing. The ultimate meaning of the hoodie is still quite contested, however. In Wilson's New York Times article, he writes that the hoodie's hood is like a cobra hood put up to intimidate others, but talks also about its anonymizing effects, before segueing directly back into the idea that a hoodie wearer would only want to be anonymous to cause trouble. He mentions graffiti artists and muggers. Just last week, Seth Meyers on The Late Show joked that Mr. Robot's general sense of mystery could be credited entirely to hoodies. A hooded sweatshirt may be, as Belichick has said, simply comfortable, but a hoodie, and by extension the person wearing one, is anonymous, threatening, and mysterious. At the end of his article, Troy Patterson asks, who enjoys the right to wear a hoodie without challenge? Not who is literally able, but who does, and in the process, does not become suspicious? Who, in my imagined distinction, puts on this item and wears a sweatshirt, and not a hoodie? Well, one easy answer is... People like me, white and upper or middle class, a demographic significantly present among hipsters, a group of people well known for moving into spaces, both literally and figuratively, and reconfiguring them for their own purpose, a group of people well known for shopping at American Apparel. We've talked before about hipsters borrowing from groups which they aren't actually members of, and this leads arguably to a search for and apparent total lack of authenticity within hipsterdom, and the hoodie is arguably no different. A working class garment raising through the ranks of factory workers, fighters, rappers, and rabble rousers to become eventually a basic, offered by American Apparel as an icon. And perhaps it is fair to say that the American Apparel hoodie specifically is iconic. 
After all, in semiotics, an icon is a sign that denotes something by resembling it, but which lacks any literal or material ties to it. It may be worth gesturing to the tragically hip, mostly metropolitan, not urban, and vainly commercialized American apparel as a force which availed the hooded sweatshirt as hoodie to a group of people who largely happened to possess the right to wear one without challenge, while somehow not counteracting the literally dangerous associations of the hoodie as such when worn by people who are challenged. To look at this another way, if the hoodie was truly mainstreamed, as say, pants, or even leather jackets by American Apparel and other retailers, then how could it have been a plausible symbol of menace when worn by Trayvon Martin? And how might it continue to be one when worn by others in the future? What is it and what will it be an icon of? And for whom after American Apparel? When I ask what the hoodie was, I don't mean to suggest that the hoodie is over. I'm just curious how it has changed and how what it was then compares to what it is now, and how what it is now may lead to what it becomes next. What do y'all think? Let me know your thoughts about hoodies, just generally, in the comments below. What are they a symbol of? What are they not a symbol of? How do they change based upon who is wearing them, and how does that compare and contrast to other articles of clothing? Let us know in the comments, and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding Pepe and his use as a hate symbol. If you want to watch that one, you can find a link in the description or wait for the end card to show up. Idea Channel has a Patreon if you would like to support the show. Thank you to all of our current patrons. In case you missed it, we recently posted a behind the scenes uh, bloopers reel. We're going to be posting some uh, desktop images pretty soon. And I think eventually we're going to do a little tour of uh, the set and the studio so that you can see um, what kind of work gets done, how and where, and some of the stuff that's on the shelves. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. The Tweet of the Week this week comes from Agru who points us towards a Valentine where it is the B movie, but your boyfriend writes out the entire script on the inside of the card. Now that is romance. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without these capitalist others.